All right, welcome to the August 8th, is it really? August 8th, Aries Cloud Agent Python user group meeting. Um, talk about the Hyperledger and OnCred's Rust project, um, PRs and other issues. I've got a few now, nightly builds is one of them, but a few to talk about. Um, so that's, and then open discussion. Um, Reminder that this is a Linux Foundation Hyperledger meeting, so the antitrust policy is in effect, which is on your screen, as well the Hyperledger Code of Conduct is in effect. So let's be good to one another, and again, there's a link to that on the screen if you haven't looked at it lately. Um, welcome any newcomers to the meeting. Um, if anyone wants to introduce themselves that's new and wants to talk about what they're doing or... or uh, say what their interest is in Akapai, uh, feel free to grab the mic now. And as well, anyone who wants to raise any issues that they want discussed at today's meeting. Yeah. All right. Um, no announcements right now. Um, Akapai documentation is out and available. We'll probably do some updates one of these days soon on um, getting the documentation aligned between the uh, what's in the repo and what's on the um, Akapai.org site, but definitely recommend using Akapai.org as your source of documentation. It basically has all of the uh, markdown files, but in a much easier, uh, much easier way to navigate around full search, much better than what's in um, GitHub for that. So um, definitely if you're looking for documentation, that's the place to go. Okay, um, the Hyperledger and OnCreds Rust project, we've got that um, pretty organized right now. I wanted to go through basically how we see it um, rolling out. Um, right now, and this is all um, Daniel Bloom and Jason Sherman's work, and they're doing the organizing on it, so I'm just the speaker here. They can jump in at any time to point out what I'm saying wrong. But um, big activity right now, and there was a PR put in uh, yesterday uh, that I'll move forward, which is get it, getting the integration test running on the Anoncred's RS branch, including um, the new the major new test for the Anon Creds implementation and on Creds Rust. So this is implementing ledger agnostic and on creds in Akapai and using uh, transitioning from the Anon Creds um, Credx implementation into the Anon Creds RS implementation. In doing that, we're going to eliminate or adjust some of the endpoints. Um, the original thought was to remove the old ones in place of the new slash and on creds endpoint. We've now decided to keep the easy ones to support. So anything where basically we would call something, the inputs and outputs are more or less the same. We might do some tweaks to the inputs and outputs, but then just replace the processing in um, in this with the processing in the anon creds um, path through. So these will be converted. Um, they will still exist to a large extent, but they'll just invoke the common uh, common code from the anon creds endpoint. We are adding slash anon creds as an endpoint. Um, where you will see a bunch of changes are in um, revocation handling. So just to, again, underline, I think we've talked about this before, but just to underline in um, existing and on creds, we support both um, Akapai doing all the work for the controller or the controller managing all of the revocation registries and the like for themselves. We are going to drop that latter part. Um, as far as we know, nobody actually did that, and it's a really difficult thing, almost impossible for a controller to do. So we're going to drop that and have basically Akapai handle all revocation registries. So the controllers, uh, the controller will just sort of say, "Hey, I want to use revocation uh, when creating a cred def." Um, 
when a uh, credential is to be revoked, it'll say revoke credential X. When it wants to publish a set of revocations, it says publish revocations for this credential definition and all of the um, processing to do with those actions are done by a non-creds. When a revocation registry runs out of credentials, a new one gets created and so on and so forth. All of the revocation registry handling will be um, outside. As well, we get some nice updates in the new and the latest updates to and on creds or, or to CL signatures that um, Andrew Whitehead's been working on. Things like um, the tails file is no longer needed by the um, by the issuer once the tails file has been created. It's no longer needed. So things like deleting the tails, the local copy of the tails file will basically be done automatically after the successful publishing of the tails file. It's no longer needed by the issuer, so it can be deleted locally. That's actually um, was something that was pointed out a long time ago. We were winding up with lots of tails files and things like that, and basically just not needed. Um, so removing things like creating a revocation registry definition and creating a, rev a revocation registry entry, those will be removed. Um, and so we'll, um, we'll be able to, um, you know, just eliminate those um, from being used. So there's only uh, a few that are actually removed. Um, things like um, um, patch revocation registry and um, set state. We're using those and fixed revocation entry state. I'm not sure those are needed anymore. The controller might need to continue to do those. So those may continue to exist. And those are um, when the local state of a revocation registry gets out of sync with the ledger state, which happens once in a while. We discovered that the painful way. Um, these allow a controller to um, repair that situation. So if um, things like publishing fails, um, now that is mostly handled automatically within um, Akapai now. So I'm not sure this, these um, controller-based calls are actually needed or whether it just is all handled automatically. So we'll be looking at those. That's why I put these as we'll investigate. So that's where we're going with that. And um, Jason, I believe you are, you know, getting these tests running. You're basically adopting the old endpoints. Is that correct? Um, yeah. So the PR yesterday was simply to get it um, to a point where it could go through the GitHub actions <laughs> without failing. So that included um, at this point commenting out a bunch of tests that were broken oh. until we um, replace the background logic for schemas and cred devs and stuff like that. Um, okay. So the next step is going to actually put the new BDD test in based on the scripts that Daniel Bloom. Right. Um, so that'll be next. And then I just kind of want to get that PR merged into the branch yeah. so we can, we can uh, start pulling in more of the stuff from Maine. Um, so we're that a non-creds RS branch is quite far behind what's been yeah. made. There's been a lot of work in the last few weeks. So um, just want to get those things so that it could pass yeah. through all the gates um, in GitHub, and then we can start moving in some code. Um, so we're a few days away, I guess, is the easiest yeah. way to say. But once that initial test is in, then we can start um, backfilling and re-enabling tests. So good. Okay, that re-enabling will involve reactivating the endpoints or adjusting a test as needed. Yeah, okay. hopefully, hopefully we won't have to change the 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 logic and the tests. It'll be the getting the endpoint to work. It'll be as it did before, but with all the new and on creds backend stuff. So that's the hope. <laughs> yeah. yeah, excellent. Okay, good. And basically that is to reduce the pain of migrating to this new version it will be a breaking change we're pretty confident of that um and if, if only because we're removing that controller um handling of revocation registries just because we don't want to re-implement that logic in the new code 
Um, but I don't think anyone has ever done that. So I think we'll be fine with that. Um, but we'll try to reduce the other, you know, typical things that people do creating schemas, creating credit apps, those should still work and be pretty straightforward to support. Um, I categorized these this morning, went through and sort of looked at the groupings of things. These are the categories of things left to do. I've, I've passed this one on to Andrew Whitehead to take a look at and um, try to get a uh, something in place for that that works for, for all of the um, clients of the Anoncreds library so that that can be, or for the, yeah, Anoncreds library. Um, there's, this is the next big thing that I think we'll, we'll probably need, um, to be done, which is, um, updates to revocation. Um, these got skipped over, um, because of the complexity of revocation. Um, the, I think the decision to, to turn off the controller access to revocation registries themselves should make that simpler, at least I hope. So, um, these are all related to revocations. Next, um, and this is an ordering I'm not sure of. These are, are basically data model changes and updates to where um, things are. Um, this is, I'm not quite sure whether that should be the next thing done or or whether we jump into revocation. Um, Daniel, did you have a, a thought on that? It seems to me this would be the next thing we would do after these two things. Um, are needed sort of in parallel? Is that, you know, or it could be either order? Uh, sorry, I was only partially following along to that. So which two components, sorry, are you saying would come next? Um, either uh, revocation can be worked on after um, what Jason's working on now, or um, these two data model ones. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I would say revocation is probably the next one in line. I would say the data model ones, um, that's more like a, it would be nice if things were in the quote unquote correct locations, um, but aren't severely negatively impacting anything. So, okay. okay. So those might go down actually, um, down to here. Um, I assume they, they would improve things for the other registry methods. Yeah. If, if I think it would be more like, uh, it would be cleaner if, uh, the indie stuff was in indie locations and yeah. then the did web stuff would be in the newly created did web locations or, 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 you know, along those lines. Um, yeah. but yeah. Okay. So that. That's that grouping. So after revocation would be the endorser updates. Um, there's a few things there in endorser. And then, and again, this order could go up uh, up as well. Um, the V1 issue credential and, and present proof to use the non-creds interface. Again, we do want to continue to support that um, with this new code. So we, we do want to update these. These should be once... Um, you know, removing, adapting the old endpoints, these become much easier to implement. And so um, those sort of move there as far as I can see. Um, finally, um, we get into the did web interface and, and then the last step will be um, all of the upgrades um, so that when we put this out, we can upgrade the storage as an automated step um basically there we would use the upgrade capabilities so that when you deploy um uh you know you have an existing implementation and you deploy it um the upgrades will trigger um so that all of the entries get appropriately updated i put this at the very bottom and this is probably not something that we want to do as part of an on creds i think i think this is a separate issue um, Daniel, any particular reason to have the Anoncreds flag on this one? Um, I suppose not. It, it, it's something that uh, we're handling it basically the same way that it's currently being handled in the new code added for Anoncreds. Yeah. So it, it applies to uh, some changes that were made in the Anoncreds, but it's not strictly yeah. 
and non creds related, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, my tendency would be to take that off um, of this, but we'll see how it goes. So that is the project. Um, anyone able, uh, willing and able to help with any of these, um, please let us know and, and we'll coordinate, um, you know, assigning and, and grouping these tasks. Um, but that's where we're going with this project and um, we'll see how it's, it is a chunk of work. As you can see, the biggest, the biggest set of tasks in this long list it was good. Um, I, you know, finally went through all of them and got a good handle on, on what the grouping was. And, and, and I'm sure all of these sort of, this will be the big, uh, the big thing is getting revocation um, dealt with. Revocation really is, is, at least as complicated as verifiable credentials themselves. So that's the work going on there. Any questions or comments from anyone? Excellent. Okay. Um, next up, I wanted to go through a few PRs. Um, we do have some new PRs that have come in. So we wanted to talk about those and um, talk about what's coming. This is an on-creds BDD test preparation. That's what um, Jason Sherman, who is using technology, um, reported. So um, that's in progress. Um, did exchange problem reports. Daniel, where are we on this one? It looks like ready to go. Yeah, that just needs some review and then it should be good. Okay, good. Um, this one, I think we are still where we were, um, after last, um, call, we did get a, I, I posted the, whoa, lots on this one. Um, I posted the thoughts on the maintainer from our last maintainer meeting and, um, uh, Maritz said he would take a look at that, uh, coming up. So that'll be, uh, something to expect soon. Um, we did suggest maybe seeing how much of the performance, um, is simply in the code that is the test code versus the non-test code. So hopefully there's a way to test that, but we'll see. Um, Cyro has been working, uh, he's not on this call, but Cyro has been working on, um, the converting from unqualified dids to did peer two and three. Um, he's made excellent progress on that, close to wrapping it up. He and I are gonna get together later today to, to go over the last steps of making sure everything is in place and figure out what's missing. Um, but basically this will um, bring us up to spec, if you will, on, on, the, did, on the did spec and and the did peer two and three and um, enable the um, upgrading of unqualified dids to be qualified dids and and be used with um, good efficiency so that we're not always sending the massive did peer two but we're using the did peer three um daniel does this report go away um with this 2394 uh, yeah, I don't think it's likely that we'll merge those changes. Um, some of the discussion there is useful, but the discussion can exist with a closed PR still. So I think we're probably going to call that one. Um, getting verification key. Uh, this one, um, we're in review process. Latest comments. Yeah, so um, I will update the branch. Should I bother? Um, take a look at this. Um, Daniel and Jason, do you mind if I assign these to you too? Yeah, that's, I, I've been intending to uh, okay. look at this in greater detail, but just haven't gotten around to it. Yeah. And then this one, Daniel, um, again, this is ready to go and just needs a review. Yes. Okay. Um. Anyone want to volunteer for this one? Okay. All right. Um, 
And then these last three, I'm going to take another look over the next little while to see um, what we can do about this. My guess is this one can be um, looked at as part of the revocation. Um, Wade Barnes, you're on the call, right? I am. You looked at this one a long time back. This this had to do with, as I recall, OpenShift and and so on. Um, there was never, I think, any great agreement on whether this should be done. Should we just close this? Uh, 1837, I'll have another look at it. Have another look at it. Um, I'll assign it to you and... Um, obviously, the person's been away for a long time. I don't think he's um, been updating it. So read through the arguments and make a call on whether we should try to keep it moving. Sure. And this one, I don't know what to do with this one. Again, Daniel Bloom, I think you are the best one to take a quick glance at this one and decide if we just close it. My gut was to close it. Okay, I can take a look. That hasn't been on my radar, so I haven't even thought about it, but uh, I can take a look. I mean, all I want, you, you know, don't don't spend a lot of time on it. Um, other, uh, just either decide to close it or let's, or encourage the person to update it because he's got conflicts and so on. Um, but if we if we need to close it, obviously it's, it's quite old, um, but that gets rid of everything other than our active our active work. So I had a, a quick comment about a recent PR that I put in and that has been merged. It was on uh, uh, additional tweaks for did web support, I think is what the, yeah, 2392 there on the list. Yeah. Um, so I it came to my attention that those changes, I thought they were going a little bit further than they actually work in terms of, of adding support. Um, so I, I've got some things that I'm following up on. Um, and as I've been digging into that, uh, I've, I'm finding that I might need to mess about in the did doc implementation. Uh, and I've been looking at Jason Cyrotox, uh, changes for the period stuff. And I, I might have some recommendations there in terms of, uh, perhaps a slightly different approach to support did web, uh, right compatibility as well um yeah i'm like very actively in the middle of doing that at this point so i don't have anything specific yet uh, but i just wanted to call that out and i'll i'll be vocal about um differences of opinion if there are any yes excellent good um marshmallow warnings was fixed yesterday this was a massive change from number of files 162 files, um, but no change in functionality uh, other than we got rid of all of our, almost all of our marshmallow warnings. So that's good. And um, there's a path to fixing, I think the rest of them um, that he was working on. Um, this was just a dependency update, um, but in the issues, um, a recommendation has gone to replace these with PyTest rough. So any, <laughs> I have no idea about this one. Any comments from Daniel? I know you commented. We want to encourage this. So it, it, it's very possible that this is just the latest tool in, in a, a long series of fad tools for, for Python and stuff. But I, I was impressed by what I saw. Uh, I went and looked at Rough, and it seems to be pretty widely used. Um, some of the projects that have been around for a long time in the Python ecosystem are adopting it. Um, and then on the flip side, on the PyTest, Flakegate, and with the deprecation and, and no longer being maintained over there, and then just generally with Flake 8, I've been frustrated with Flake 8 in the past um, in terms of uh, like ideologically with the maintainers. There's been some differences of opinion there, so that's been fun. Uh, so I, I've been in favor of, of looking for alternatives to Flake 8 for a little while now. Um, I, I wasn't aware of Rough, but I, I liked what I saw. So it's I'm interested. Um, the only thing that was a little strange to me was the version number on it being something yeah. that's not 
I, I don't even know how to interpret having 282 releases without having a minor or a major number in there, but uh, yeah. Um, well, I mean, conceivably that's nightly builds and they were building something that's supposed to be compatible with long existing stuff, who knows? Okay, um, that one's coming. This is that um, last piece, I believe, um, that was gonna be looked at. We've got the set of an on creds ones. Um, oh, nightly builds. That was the one that I wanted to look at, and I had that linked in. Um, we're whoops um, in here. Um, so twenty two fifty. Um, Jason put this in quite a while ago. Um, BC Gov team is now thinking this is a higher priority than we thought. So chances are we're going to get this done much sooner than later, in the next few days, we hope, um, so that we generate basically a nightly build. That build can be used, for instance, in AATH, which will make it go a lot faster and still be relatively up to date. And we can use this in, in other places um, where we've got um, downstream. So basically a, a, a dev um, a dev build, including all of the artifacts, um, including a container um, a container image gets created out of this. That's the idea. Um, Emiliano, any other comments on that? Uh, no, you basically summarize it very well. Um, I can just say that the re some of the reasons that we are looking at accelerating these is we have, um, we're developing a few new features, namely uh, about the multi-ledger support in traction and having the nightly builds would help a lot like moving that forward rather than having to have custom images built. So a, a quick follow-up question to that. So you, uh, images, um, I think there's a really obvious way for us to do that since we have the GitHub container registry and that, you know, goes pretty smoothly, I would say. Um, are we planning on also publishing nightly builds to like PyPy for the actual Python package itself? Or what were we thinking there? Out of curiosity. That That is a good question. Uh, I am not sure what the best way forward would be because <clears throat> while the image I see it as a way of like testing things quicker if it is an unsupported or unofficial release might be just a bit of overhead publishing to PyPy but it would keep it consistent so uh, I don't know I don't have yeah. strong opinions Wait, any thoughts on that sorry can we just review real quick yeah so the idea is um this is about nightly builds and yeah. um that Emiliano particularly wants is the um is publishing a, a, a container image to a nightly G container image yeah I think we have an issue for that actually already a night for a nightly container image yeah so we we have that and we're planning on implementing it the question would be um do we want to publish to PyPy at the same time or or should we just go with an image um... I, I'm not a huge fan of nightly packages. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. Question is, would they would they would it be useful? Like, would what does everybody else think? Like well, Daniel, would would you use a, a nightly package ever? Yeah. So, we're just, you. Um, sorry. Uh, so I'm aware of at least a couple of different instances where rather than building directly from images. There's been some requirements where people have built their own images and then pull in ACPY from PyPy. Um, and kind of the, the default right now, if there's a, a feature or a change that they need that's not released yet, uh, people have resorted to referencing the GitHub repo at main, which works. Um, and probably is not too different from pulling from a nightly package from PyPy, I guess, in terms of like overhead and, and changing like configuration for builds and stuff. Uh, but it, it, I don't know. I have mixed feelings. Um, I, I don't, I could see it probably going either way. I don't 
have too strong of opinions on that, I guess. I mean, it would be simple. It's simple enough to do. The only, my only concern is like the extra uh, craft that ends up in PyPy after that. Yeah, I was, I was reading online actually about that recently. And I think there's a maximum number of, of published images permitted like per package or something like that. So we would, I think we would have to go back and clean up old nightly yeah, builds. For sure. Um, which, yeah, again, might not be too much fun. Well, to have to worry about. Let's, let's create a ticket for it and then we can discuss it further and see, you know, yeah. what we would need to do. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so for now, we'll just go with the container image. Mm -hmm. And we'll um, leave it at that for now. Now and and then we we decide from there if anyone else wants it. Yeah, one okay. positive step forward. Yeah. yeah. Um, reminder: these are all of the things that have gone in since we last met. Um, update for ARM issues, a workaround. We've got a guy who's walk, working through all of our repos to get those done. Um, Jason's um, preserving exchange records. Um, this is the big breaking change that unless you add this um, presentation exchange records will be removed once the interaction is complete from Akapai. So the controller needs to take care of whatever it needs to take care of. Um, a few other uh, other changes. The big one, oh yeah, the other one that I wanted to highlight was, was this one that Shanjot's completed, which is um, in multi-tenant, we can now have um, supportable write ledgers. <clears throat> so a, a multi-tenant in instance can have one tenant writing to one ledger and another tenant writing to a different ledger. So all of them have to be supported by the, by the overall um, implementation, but each tenant can select their own. So that's all positive. Um, so those are the latest updates that have gone in. Um, and I think those are the topics that I wanted to go over. Um, so we're ending. We've got lots of, of time available. I didn't have any other topics for this. Is there any other discussion? And as I say that, I think of one that I wanted to bring up. Um, I don't know if we have anyone on um, that's been also playing with the AFJ library, but um, is it time to think about um, adding um, OpenID for VC support to um, to Akapai? I know they've been putting some of it into AFJ and we could sort of um, copy what they're doing. Um, is there interest in any groups um, in having that functionality available? Akif? Um, I guess my personal opinion is it would maybe expand the feature set for Akapai. I, I don't know of anybody who's actively using it personally, but uh, I don't think it would there would be any harm in saying like, hey, Akapai supports also open ID for VC. I think it would just make it much a much more uh, rounded out product as well, right? I'd be in favor of, of including it. So we've actually done some investigation into adding this to Akapai, um, or adding support in some way to Akapai. Um We've actually been wondering if it would make sense for this to be something that's deployed as a companion to Akapai as opposed to something that we implemented directly within, at least when it came to the, the server side support for the OpenID for VCI protocol. Um, client side, that would, but I think that would might make sense to be something that's directly added. Um, but uh, because the open ID for VCI, it, it adds a, a set of endpoints uh, which need to be publicly accessible. Um, Akapai doesn't really have a good way of having a, uh, extensible endpoints beyond the admin API endpoints, and those aren't things that would be generally publicly accessible endpoints. Um, right. Anyways, so it, it it seems to us at least that one way we could do it is you have a, a, a companion service that 
can call into ACPI for like um, preparing a, a, a JWT credential or a JSON-LD credential or whatever. Um, and then it just gives you the payload and then you can pass that back as, as this remote service um, over the OpenID for BCI protocol. Like, a, like a plugin? Yeah, more or less, but I, I think it probably wouldn't be as close to ACPI as a plugin would be, in, in my opinion, because it would interact over, I, I don't know. I don't know. I could see it going either way. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's funny you say that, though, but that's that's basically the architecture of VC off N, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, it would be doing the same thing where VC off N uses what's needed from Akapai, but handles, you know, all of the OAuth stuff on its own. Yeah. Interesting. I, I like the idea of being able to maintain that kind of functionality separate from Akapai, where Akapai, it's its main shtick, I guess, is didcom protocols. And it also has like uh, a secure storage element and verifiable credential issuance and stuff. But like the, the bulk of the code within Akapai itself is didcom. So keeping that focus on didcom within the Akapai code base. And then if there's additional protocols that we want to implement, having those be a companion to Akapai, whether that's a plugin or a separate service entirely, um, that enables us to you know, uh, adapt and develop with these other protocols in a more organic way, I think. So, cool. I, I also should have prefaced my comment by saying I'm not fully aware of what the technical impl uh, implications are. So I appreciate the, the sort of discussion on it. I just, just from a sort of outside perspective, it'd be kind of cool to see more features and you know, it was always nice to see more features. <laughs> yeah. So if we if we did it as a separate service, um, then I think there is going to be an increased amount of like credential preparation endpoints available within Akapai's admin API, yeah. um, because we would want to expose an endpoint for us to be able to, uh, you know, prepare a JSON LD credential without all of the other additional steps that are involved in doing that over the issue credential didcom protocol. Um, we, we do have some existing endpoints that kind of go in that direction. We recently merged in the JWT sign and verify endpoints. So if, if you're willing to manage all of the verifiable credential creation outside of ACPI, you, you have that endpoint available at least. Um, it's, it's, an, it's a possibility, I guess, to doing JWT VC, but not a really batteries included way of doing it. Um, and, and we have a similar endpoint for the JSON-LD documents as well. We've got a sign endpoint and a verify endpoint there. Uh, so if we had a remote service, we would need to flesh out the capabilities of those types of endpoints. Sorry, just a second. Cool, okay. Sorry, I sorry, I just had a distraction come in. Uh, um, so the other side of that is, uh, if we did it as a plugin, we wouldn't have to expose uh, like some of the credential preparation stuff as admin API endpoints. We could use the existing code within Akapai. Um, I'm not sure which is the better approach of those two, but those are things that we've been considering at least. I don't know that we can say that we've gotten too deep on any of those yet. Excellent. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you both for comments. Anyone else um, on that topic? And otherwise, any other topics people want to talk about? So there's one thing that I was hoping to bring up on the maintainers meeting last week, but we ran out of time. Uh, and that was uh, code coverage reports for, for Akapai. We used to have... Um, some service that was running. I don't remember what it was called even at this point. Um, but we had on each PR, we had a report of whether uh, coverage right. increased or decreased significantly, um, which was handy. Um, 
for you know giving us a good view of like we've added stuff that we haven't adequately covered with our tests yet and so there's more to more work to do kind of a thing um so I, I would be interested in getting code coverage reports in some form available again uh, to accompany PRs. Um, anyone recall what we were using? I can visualize the logo. It was an umbrella, but I don't remember what the service was called. Yeah. Wave, yeah, you might, isn't that like that code is, that code, is code, code, code that is code cov yeah the umbrella is code cov and i do remember those reports and you're right we haven't seen them for a while um yeah i think i think we ended up moving away from that because of the um hyperledger account associated to it but what we surely would have replaced it with something we did i thought there are when the tests run in the actions uh it will emit a code coverage report for the whole code base but it's just it's not a very consumable and it doesn't like it doesn't show up as a comment on the prs itself um so you'd have to go in and, and look at the test run um, and you just get a whole dump of, of code coverage information. So it's hard to evaluate if it's increasing or decreasing uh, as a result of the changes or not. There'd be a PR associated with the change. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking of five, just finding, looking at quick ways to see. Where do we see any sort of coverage, even that though, I don't uh, know. So it, it would be on the PR, uh, yeah, on the PR test section instead of the integration test one. Okay. Um... I think you would see it on the P the PR page. I didn't see it on the PR page when I looked. Yeah, and then if you expand the tests all the way at the bottom, there is a coverage report that's a long way down and if i could accurately use a mouse it would be even easier test reports coverage.xml is it just a matter of adding some additional stuff to expose the report. That's like it. So there is a coverage.xml. And where does that go? Anyone know how to get to that? Anyway, okay, this is something to look at for sure. Yeah, I think we'd have to explicitly upload the artifact from the action. Otherwise, it's probably not preserved. Exactly. It's yeah. just errors. Okay. So, yeah, finding out why and what to do about that one. Okay, I'll add that to the tickets. So it is being collected, it's just disappearing into the ether. Anyway, um, okay. I had one more topic um, since we've got some space. Um, I see Freddie has his hand up as well. I can I can defer. I'm happy to bring it up after. Go ahead, Pradeep. Yeah, so I had this uh, requirement. Uh, so for integration of SSI with some uh, identity and access management tools, uh, the traditional ones like Okta. So uh, is it, has it been done already or, um, um, is there any resources available for this? Has anyone here, uh, Daniel or Wade, uh, looked into this before? So um, I assume Okta integration would be similar to Keycloak integration. Is that accurate? 
similar to that. Yes, I guess so. Yeah. So the VC auth N, have you looked at that at all? I was looking into this. So this uh, OIDC for VC and VC auth N, they are similar, right? Yes. Yeah. So this VC auth N, basically, what it it it's a control or a sep uh, you know a separate um, component from Akapai that that uses an Akapai instance and basically allows you to specify a presentation request and then use it in an authentication interaction. So um, on, the, on the wallet side, on the holder side, they get a QR code and they interact with their wallet. On the um, enterprise side, uh, a, a relying party that knows how to use, you know, Keycloak, or, or some other OIDC, you know, basically an OIDC relying party is able to just call this and it has, knows nothing about DITCOM or SSI or anything. It just knows about um, OIDC. It gets back a jot um, that contains the, um, the attributes that were included in the attribute in the presentation request. So there's... Got it. There is a 2.0 branch in this that you definitely want to look at. You don't want to use the 1.0 because it was based on a, um, a now um, no longer open source component, but there is a 2.0 that will be um, coming out soon. All in the chat. Yeah, in the chat. So take a look at that and um, yeah, feel free to ask questions about that. Lots of activity going on in that. You've actually got several people on this call that are are doing active development in that repo, so that we get to the the two point branch um, completion. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Daniel, back to you. Uh, yes. Let me remind myself. Um, so, a point of discussion, I suppose, um, is. Uh, when do we stop running tests on indie wallets? Um, Pretty so soon. For, yeah. Yeah. For yeah. instance, the the we run a PR test for indie specific yeah. um, build, and then we have one without. Um, and then our BDD tests, the integration tests, are um, uh, being built with indie included within the image at least i'm not sure if the indie wallet type is actually getting used or if the ascar wallet type is being used on those um i assume ascar but i haven't looked deeply enough to know for sure um but uh if we did decide to stop running the bdd tests on indie period uh yeah. we could actually significantly improve the the action runtime on that because it has to go through an image build and everything yeah. uh so yeah um, I think so. So I would be happy to see that removed. People should not be using the Indie SDK, bottom line. Um, it's too old and not not being maintained, um, and people have to migrate off it. So we have announced it's deprecated. We're still, um, I would be more than happy. In the 090, we said it was deprecated. I would be more than happy to stop testing on it. So as a kind of just a, a introspection question here, if there was something that needed to be fixed on NDSDK, what is what are the chances that we would actually address it and uh, like put out a bug fix release for the NDSDK? Uh, Considering the whole entire pipe uh, build and test pipeline for the NDSDK has been uh, shut down, probably very rare like it, it would have to be something pretty serious and even then it would probably be faster to people to migrate to aries okay and even if even if the change was scoped to occupy's usage of existing indie sdk builds would that so i don't know if that's something we you know when you ask that that's that's the main question um you know we could if we wanted to do extra work, we could switch the indie test to be nightly tests as opposed to, um, you know, sort of separate them off and run them nightly versus um, at all, but definitely change the PR ones to, to be just ASCAR. 
Uh, but any, you know, from an Akapai perspective, any sort of fixes that, that we would do, I mean, again, open source project, we can do, anyone can do anything. Our, our move would always be to correct by switching. So, um, right. you know, yeah, it's just there, there's no, there's no working test and deployment pipeline for the ND SDK at this, this point in time, even the existing one that was being hosted by the Sovereign Foundation has not been run in, oh, geez, uh, maybe like a year. So even if we were to spin that back up, um, what it, chances are it's not going to function and will require some um, care and feeding for it to get it to work again. And the GitHub pipeline, the GitHub workflows on it were never completed. So they only touch bits and pieces of it. But I think the point Daniel was making was what if the bug was in Akapai? Uh, in yeah. So at most I would want to have, you know, you know, maybe the thing to do is to step back to have it. And I assume that's possible as we, we basically duplicate the, the PR action to run nightly and only run the, you know, remove the indie or comment out the indie tests in one copy and and copy out everything but the indie tests in the other. But that that might be a deprecation type strategy. Is that do you think that's a good idea or we just drop them entirely? I think if I think if there ended up being like uh, like Daniel, are you talking like you know if we run into something in the future, or are you talking something that is we're running into someone's running into imminently? Uh, it's it's hypothetical. I don't have okay. any specific so, instances of hi, hi, hypothetical. I think the best way to deal with that is continue with the deprecation, get rid of it. If we find that we need to. Um, fix something that happens to be critical um, that is necessary for, you know, fix around inside uh, Akapai for the NDSDK, then we would like branch and tag at that point and release a patch for whatever version was like, what are we at 090 um, that fixes, fixes that issue, but moving forward, we wouldn't support it. So it would basically be a one-off patch fix. And in the process of it being a one-off patch fix, we can do one-off type things like, you know, invoking a workflow that runs specifically indie tests, right? We don't necessarily yes. need the, in, the indie stuff being run nightly for that. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, um, especially considering the, the level of support and ability for any sorts of updates to indie SDK, not- Well, not, that way feasible. we're not, the, we're not bringing, any um baggage with us we only create it when we need it yeah technical debt was the word i was actually looking for okay I wouldn't say done to the 090 tag. I would say done based on the 090 tag. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yep. Okay. Um, what about this idea of do we split the tests and keep a separate run nightly? Do we think is is anyone willing to do that? Um, they're they're already separated. Daniel did a really good job of that, but I I don't think I think once we I guess it'll be like the O dot one zero uh, release, which will eliminate the Indie SDK. So I would say we just drop the nightly test for it. I don't think we if we're planning on get, getting rid of it. I think we should you know remove the technical debt as we move forward. 
And like we said, if, if there is a critical issue that we need to fix, then we can introduce that technical debt at that point in time. Okay. Okay. That way it becomes, you know, very clear that we are no longer supporting the NDSDK. Okay, and is it comment out or remove? Remove. Okay. Source controls our friend. We can always bring something back. We can look at the revision history. And do we and and you said there is a nightly run of indie tests, so we keep that for now. Uh, the, there is, but I don't think we need it. I think we can eliminate that. I, just, I, I think if we're gonna, I think eliminate as you know technical debt as we move forward, and if we need to in, reintroduce it to you know deal with a specific issue, then we do it at that time. Yeah. Any objections to that from anyone? Okay, thanks for raising that one, Daniel. Um, I will uh, put in the ticket for that. Cool. Excellent. All right, and we're right on time. Thanks all for attending. Um, have a great one. Thanks, Steve. A couple of weeks. Uh, maintainers meetings. So those, anyone interested, we are having maintainers uh, meetings on the off weeks. So if anyone wants, um, it is on the calendar, you're welcome to join. Um, but otherwise, it's um, the maintainers getting together for actually a quite a similar discussion to what we had today. We mostly had maintainer type issues on this one. So see you next week, uh, maintainers. Take care, all. Bye. Right. Thanks. Bye. Bye.